What does it mean to master something and to get good at something? Well, a lot of people say that you have to pay the dues to be the best in the world. And I say, listen, there's no dues to pay. That's just a myth. He's been an investor. He founded 20 companies of his own. And his best-selling book, Choose Yourself, has been named one of the best business books of all time. Written countless articles and conducted some of the most revealing interviews ever captured. I started out at HBO as a computer programmer. And then I started a company. I became an investor, I started writing books. I've owned a comedy club. I do a podcast. It's hard for me to put a finger on what I actually do. But instead of paying my dues on an interest that I have, I'm able to come up with creative ways to go around the gatekeepers, the people who are collecting the dues. There are learning techniques you can use to be in the top 1%. It originally comes from this guy, Anders Ericsson, who was a professor who did all the research for it. And basically he says, with 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, you could be among the best in the world at anything. But I much prefer what I call the 10,000 experiments rule. And the whole point is, is that you should think of ways almost every day to experiment in your life. Can we talk about your asking for a raise example? I think that's relevant for anyone in corporate. Yeah, I love this one because this is money in the bank. This has made me tons of money, this one technique. You're gonna be nervous the first time, just say, with a straight face. Yeah, fam, welcome back to the show. I'm super excited for today's episode. We're gonna be interviewing James Altucher. If you don't know him, he's a jack of all trades. He's a super popular podcaster, author, as well as a very successful businessman. He's actually built over 20 different companies over the years, and he's sold several of them for millions of dollars. And he's written many best-selling books, including Choose Yourself, The Power of No, and Skip the Line, which is gonna be the topic of today's episode. And when it comes to skipping the line, James is absolutely no stranger. He has pivoted his career so many times, always becoming very successful at what he does. And he's learned a lot along the way doing this. And so I can't wait to pick his brain today so that we can all become top 1% in our niche. So without further ado, James, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Hala, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm very, very excited. I'm really excited for this interview. You know, I researched so much about you and you're somebody who I've always known your name. I've known about your podcast. I've known about your your books, like your concept of choosing your own life and everything like that. But I actually never knew that you had so much business experience. So when I was researching you for the show, I realized that you had started all these companies. You even like sold one of your companies for 15 million. I think you sold a couple companies for many, many millions of dollars. So that was surprising to me. So I thought, we could start there. Uh, can you talk to us about some of your early companies, your early experiences as an entrepreneur, and how you ended up selling your first business for $15 million? Sure. And the, the funny thing is, is that, as you mentioned, you, you didn't really know initially that I had this various business experience. And I've never enjoyed business. But of <laughs> course, it is a path to making good entrepreneurial money. I didn't really enjoy having a job either. So you either have a job or you have a side hustle or you have a, a, a business so you can build wealth. You, you build wealth by owning things. So owning your own business is a great way to build wealth. So I happen to have been good at it. There's, there's three skills to money. There's making it, keeping it, growing it. I was good at making it. I wasn't always so good at keeping it. And I had to go through, I had to learn the hard way, unfortunately. So, but yeah, back in the mid nineties, there was this, little thing called the web that was starting to happen. And it was just starting to happen. Like people, people were in the phase still, oh, this is just a fad. You can't do anything with this. Nobody's on the internet. And all those people were, who were saying this were kind of correct. Like nobody really knew what was going to happen. And, but I was obsessed. I was obsessed. I, I, I have a, a technology background. I, I studied computer science. I was a programmer. I'd put in my 10,000 hours programming. And there were like five people in New York City at that time who knew how to make a website. I was one of them. So I was working at HBO at the time. My real dream was to make a TV show. And, but HBO didn't have a website. No company had a website. So I convinced HBO to make a website and they're like, well, who should build it? And I said, I could build it. And they said, nah, nah, we need a real company to build it. So essentially I started a company and hired myself to build the HBO website. And then, which sounds a little weird, but there was really nobody else 
<laughs> website. And then uh, other companies, I, we, we started, I, I made a website, I made the American express.com when they first launched the website, timewarner.com, uh, the utility company, kindedison.com. But then I started specializing in just entertainment companies. So I did websites for almost every major movie studio, lots of famous movies like the Matrix movies, the Scream movies, and, and, and so on that were popular back then. Uh, a lot of, uh, you could tell by the way I look, I did a lot of gangster rap record label websites. <laughs> and uh, and we we had a pretty good niche and we built up to like 30 or 40 employees, ongoing business. But at the same time, I really felt like it was getting easy to make a website. Like I would not be able to charge hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a website in the future. I mean, they were teaching it in middle school, kids how to make a website. And uh, that's when I felt it's very important to, to sell the business. And so we did. I sold it uh, and made about $15 million cash from the sale. And about two years later, I was completely and utterly broke. That's that's where I didn't have the skill of keeping it. Well, talk to us about that. How did you end up losing that $15 million in a course of just two years? You know, when you, sometimes when you make money, like money is such a, uh, it's, it's so important in society. Like, uh, again, money is not everything, but it's a lot of things. And I had a problem. Like I thought I had two problems. One is I thought I was smart just because I had made some money. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you could make it here, you can make it anywhere sort of feeling. And I also had some weird problem where I saw that lots of other people were making more money than me. Like this was the beginning of that internet boom, mm -hmm. which was followed by a bust, but it was still booming. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm poor. Like I don't have any money. And, and it was ridiculous feeling like it was this I don't know what you can call it. It was it, like it imposter was, syndrome kind of. Yeah, there was an imposter syndrome. There was also this this money had not filled whatever it was that mm. I was lacking inside. Like I thought maybe people would like me more if I had money. But if I thought that many other people had more, then people aren't going to like me. This sounds a little too psychological, but but there was something wrong with me. And so I started making big investments to make more money and and none of them worked. So I just, I remember at one point where, where I had literally $15 million in my checking account at the beginning of this phase. And then, and I had never had any money before I sold this company. I did not grow up with money. I didn't have any money. And within two years, about two years later, I reload on my checking account and there's $143 left. Like I had mm. no money. And I lost my home. I was so depressed for like years. I just lost everything. I mean, everything you could possibly lose, I lost. And it took a, it took a while to sort of come back. And then I started, a, eventually I started another business, sold that for millions, and then went broke again. And this is where I felt like this is ridiculous. I can't, what, I'm never going to make money again. I thought to myself, I've got to start figuring this out. Like, what is my problem? And I bit by bit really started to live, maybe live a better, you have to live like the kind of person who's going to make and keep and grow lots mm. of money. You can't, I just sort of assumed that the process of growth, uh, emotional growth had stopped once I made money. That was the goal was to make money. And then I stopped. But then I, now I realize you have to be a better person to kind of make and keep the money. And I'm not saying everybody with money is a great person, but for me, that that was the way it had to be. It was almost like you there was something else missing from your life and you were trying to fill it with money, but it didn't work. So you kept losing your money. Yeah. And I don't know why I felt things were missing. I mean, I, I loved my life. I had beautiful babies and and but then I panicked. I had to raise them with zero money mm. and I ruined I felt like I had ruined their futures. But but yeah, it's all started off somehow or other. I didn't have enough self respect or self-worth feelings of self-worth to think that hey i've got generational wealth here and i could put this to good use mm -hmm. and i could i could you know live a positive life and help people move forward and instead i just you know when, when you when you take risks to make a lot of money quickly you're going to lose that money that's just a, a rule of investing pretty much and you know as a result of this experience i kind of became almost religious about studying 
or obsessed, I should say, about studying investing and, and learning what I didn't know and and just learning more about money and business. So ultimately, I would say this past decade or so, things have been better, but it was very painful. And I, I know a lot of people go through failure and, and losing money and losing business. And, and sometimes people wear it as like a badge of honor, like I failed, so now I can succeed. But it's really just one of the worst things that can happen to you. <laughs> Because money really is like a, a measure of some sort of worth in society. And when you lose it all, it kind of just de- takes a lot out of you. Totally. And what I really respect about you is that you seem like a person who's always trying to improve yourself. I mean, all the books that you write are always about like how to improve your life, how to improve your skills and all that kind of good stuff. So I love that about you. I want to talk to all of my employers out there. Let's talk about company culture for a second. At Yap Media, we have a really unique company culture and we're all obsessed with excellence and we even call ourselves scrappy hustlers. We're all scrappy hustlers at Yap Media and my team is growing fast and hiring is a pain in the butt, especially if you're looking for A players that are gonna roll up their sleeves. But luckily, when it comes to hiring, I no longer feel overwhelmed by the search for the perfect candidate because I use Indeed, the ultimate hiring platform. Indeed's matching engine always presents me with a pool of high-quality candidates that match my job description to a T. If you're tired of drowning in your hiring pool, Indeed is here to rescue you. You can use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging your candidates, making the entire hiring process a breeze. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree that Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. I've hired some of my best employees indeed, some of my best scrappy hustlers. With over 140 million qualifications and preferences analyzed every day, Indeed is constantly learning from your hiring preference. So the more you use Indeed, the better it actually gets at finding your perfect match. Join the ranks of more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that have already chosen Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of my show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash profiting. Just go to Indeed.com slash profiting right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash profiting. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So something else that I was really surprised to find out about you was all the different careers that you've had over the years. So you were like really into chess at one point, you were in IT, you've had all these different jobs. I think you even owned a hedge hedge fund at one point. Can you yeah. talk to us about all these different career pivots and why you think you change careers so much? I think everybody gets, well, let me ask you, how many careers have you had? You haven't always been doing a show on YouTube. YouTube didn't exist. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I've been doing lots of relatively similar things. I mean, I started my career in radio, then I started a blog, then I had, um, you know, I did marketing experience. Now I have a social agency, a podcast network and this podcast. So I feel like actually a lot of my experiences were different, but sort of like all combined to what I do today, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think, I think that's almost the case with, with a lot of people. Like I started out, like, as I mentioned, as a computer programmer, I was, my title at HBO was junior analyst programmer. And it was the <laughs> lowest person on the entire hierarchy of, of HBO, which was a television company, uh, still is. And, uh, and then I started a company, but all along I was trying to like write a novel or write a screenplay and I became an entrepreneur. Then I became an investor. Then I started writing books. Then I started writing books that were more like, personal stories rather than about investing or finance. But I've also, I've owned a comedy club. I was a stand-up comedian for six years. I taught, toured all over the world. Uh, I, um, I've started many businesses. So it's hard to, it's hard for me to put a, uh, you know, I do a podcast. It's hard for me to put a finger on what I actually do because I've, because <laughs> the business I've started, have been all over the place as well. But I think that's fine. I think you should, you should try as much as possible to do things that you're passionate about. Now you can't always do those things for money, but you can try to, to balance it out. Like you, do, we only live a certain number of years. So you don't want to sacrifice the things you love to do more of the things you hate. Mm. So sure. Like I always wonder, Oh, instead of those six years where I was doing stand up comedy, making no money, I could have gone to, moved to San Francisco, like many of my friends did and 
you know, started another tech company or invested in tech companies and made a billion dollars like some of my friends did. But I always balanced what I love doing with making sure, you know, my money situation's good. I'm okay. You know, I've, I'm a little older. I've survived a couple of failures. I've, I've had several businesses succeed now and, and I'm very happy about that. But, but I always want to make sure that I can't sacrifice doing the things I love. Mm. And so for many years, I loved comedy for many years and still do love writing and writing books for many years. I love playing chess. So when I was younger, when I was much younger, I was a, a ranked master in tournament chess. And now after a 30 year break, I'm going back to it. <laughs> and it's very interesting to see I'm older. <laughs> like there's just no doubting it now. Like I was younger when I was, when I was first playing in tournaments and I was better as a result of being young. Mm -hmm. And now it's just very, it's uh, different stories, but, but along the way, it's not that I'm just trying to get better at, at something like comedy or chess or writing. It's the path to improving yourself to be the sort of person who can succeed. That's what is, gives me a lot of pleasure now is the, is the pro people always say it's the journey, not the goal. The goal is important too, but along the way is becoming the sort of person who can achieve that goal is very satisfying. The path to mastery is a very satisfying path. Yeah. And I think a lot of what you're saying is also following your passion, right? Life is so short, you should do what you love. So is it safe to say that you've made so many career changes because you just found joy and passion in a lot of different things that you just you wanted to try and master? Yeah. And you know, you're not passionate about the same thing for 50 straight years. Nobody is. So you're passionate about different things all throughout your life. And it depends how much you want to pursue those passions. Sometimes if you like golf, you'll make sure you play on a Sunday, but it doesn't affect your career. I had this maybe bad tendency to get obsessed with whatever it was I was passionate with. So I would give up almost everything else to, to pursue a passion. That may be a bad thing, but it's served me well. and very. It's given me lots of adventures. Hmm. So somebody might see like your resume or somebody else's resume, they, if they see a lot of career pivots, their first thought might be like, well, they must not be very good at anything if they've only spent, you know, three, four years on each thing and then moved along, right? What would you say to the person who who says something like that, that you can't you're, get good enough in that amount of time? You're absolutely right. Like I'm probably a jack of all trades, master of none. I mean, <laughs> look, again, I did all these years of, of stand-up comedy. Okay, I got okay enough to make people laugh who were total strangers and maybe drunk and I'm on a stage and they're in an audience, but I didn't become like the best chess. I started young. I had some skill. I, but then I stopped because college and, and, you know, dating and then business and other things, I didn't have time to really play. So, you know, now I'm playing again. I'm not, I'm not among the best. And, but, but it's not about being the best. Who remembers? Who, who cares if you're the best? Okay. There's mm. maybe a, some subculture of people who care you're the best, but the people who are, who are around me, who I love and who love me, they just care that I'm that I'm happy and I care that they're happy. And I don't walk around thinking, oh, I'm not Chris Rock. I can't, I'm, my life is over. Or, you know, I'm not the number one chess player in the world. You know, this is, this is the worst. Or my latest book didn't make all the bestseller lists. You know, I've written 25 books, but I'm a total failure. Uh, you know, nobody, at the end of the day, people remember who you are and, and the effect you've had on them. Like my kids, I never tell them what to do. I never say you should do this. Instead, I try to legitimately lead by example. Like I ask myself, am I doing something right now that I would want my children to do when mm -hmm. they're older? And if the answer is no, then I try not to do it. Like if I'm yelling at someone, I don't want my kids to be angry. So I try not to be angry. Or if I'm doing something that's unique and creative, I like my kids to see that and other people around me uh, to see that different things in life are possible than the usual path. Yes, I made some money. Yes, I lost it, but I kind of figured out how to live a better life and, and make it back and I've done well. But yes, also I've, I've also sacrificed making money because I wanted to make sure I get to do some 
things I lo really love doing and want to try doing. And I experiment a lot. I do things that maybe aren't a career, maybe aren't going to be passions that last for six years or five years or whatever, but I want to do them anyway. So like a, a, a particular experiment, uh, the day after the last election, the 2020 election, I went to fec.gov, which is the Federal Elections Commission website that the U.S. government runs. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there's very little paperwork that you have to fill out to run for president. <laughs> so I filled out all the paperwork. I think I paid a little bit of a fee. And along with people like Donald Trump and Joe Biden, I'm a candidate for president of the United States. Wow. Like, you may be our oh, only hope. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But, you know a writing candidate. I'm not going to be on the ballot anywhere, but there's a lot, it turns out there's a lot of people running and I encourage people, you should, Holly, you should run for president. Just, just fill out the paperwork. That's all you have to do. Yeah. So I didn't bring up that question to say that I actually thought you were going to answer that in a completely different way, because I actually think you've gotten really good at things in short amounts of time. And I think this is a great segue to actually your book, Skip the Line. So that came out in 2021. It was COVID times. Um, I have to say, I read books all the time. And this one is like jam packed with so many fun nuggets and gems, even relevant today, you know, three years later. So my first question to you related to this book is, hey, young and profiters, let's talk about focus. When I started my LinkedIn Secrets Masterclass, I needed focus to create the best course possible. I didn't have time to worry about how to set up my website and collect payments. And that's why I set up my store on Shopify. Launching App Academy through Shopify was one of the best decisions I've ever made. We made nearly $500,000 so far. And since I sell a course, that's pretty much pure profit. Are you ready to be young and profiting too? Then launch your business with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, whether you're a side hustler, new entrepreneur, or rocking a multi-million dollar business. And it doesn't matter if you're selling scented soap or a marketing masterclass like me. Shopify helps you sell anything everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. And when it comes to e-commerce, Shopify turns online window shoppers into actual buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. We're talking 36% better on average compared to other platforms with features like abandoned cart campaigns, discount promo codes, and so much more. And fun fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., including huge brands like Thrive Cosmetics and Allbirds. In fact, I interviewed the CEO of Allbirds, Joey Zwillinger, on episode 255, and he told me when it came to their breakout success, it was all about focus. Joey constantly reminded his team that they were a product and marketing company first. Everything needed to come back to making the most comfortable shoe in the world. Allbirds was not an e-commerce business, so they didn't try to be. They leveraged Shopify like me to sell their shoes from day one. And in their very first month, they made over a million dollars in sales through Shopify. And then once they were ready to go into retail, they leveraged Shopify's POS system to scale effortlessly. So take it from me and Joey, no matter your stage, no matter if it's online or in person, Shopify is always the right commerce platform for you because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash profiting and that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash profiting now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash profiting. Why did you feel like you had to write it? Well, it's a very good point. I want to... I wanna, yeah, go back. I want to describe like, what does it mean to master something and to get good at something? Well, a lot of people think you have to be the best in the world or you have to be rich and famous at what you're doing to say that you've mastered it. So yes, I'm not a top 10 comedian or a top 10 writer. Maybe I like to think I'm a top 10 writer. Yeah. Uh, top 10 chess player. But I do think, and I think that's very hard to do. That's where the whole 10,000 hours or whatever comes in. But I do think I am, whatever I like to pursue, I like to think that I get into the top 1%. Mm -hmm. So I'll use, just use chess as an example. There's 600 million people around the world who know the rules to chess. Arguably, the top 1% means you have to be in the top 6 million of those arguably I'm in the top 1 million of those or even better. So, but I consider myself not so good because looking at it from my perspective, there's a lot of people I know who are much better. Same things with, with business, with investing, with everything that I've pursued. But I do think it's relatively easy to get into the top 1% of what you pursue. And there's a lot of benefits to that. One is every 
area of life worth pursuing has a strong and fun subculture. So mm -hmm. you get to experiment being in all these different subcultures. There's like a comedy subculture, a writing subculture, a, a TV subculture, a investing subculture. Mm -hmm. You get to kind of communicate with different people across the spectrum of all your very interests. And and you get some status in those subcultures if you're in the top 1%. So I think it is relatively easy. And this is what I wrote the book Skip the Line about, is that it's not like cheating, but there are learning techniques you can use to be in the top 1%. Let's say you're interested in cooking. To be in the top 1% of cooking, I mean, a billion people around the world or more know how to cook. To be in the top 1% means to be in the top 10 million of those. That's very easy to do. It's not trivial. You have to work at it. But there are... If you just use these methods, you can do it. Just as an example, though, so this is a photo I have, and um, I'll put the mic down a little bit. But uh, so this was a comedy. This was inside a comedy club I owned, where I also had my podcast studio. And just going around, this is me. This is uh, I invited a bunch of friends to see a podcast I was doing. This is Jim Norton, who's a famous comedian. He uh, just had a Netflix special. This is the Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan. So I did all the Wu-Tang Clan's websites in the 90s, and he also played <laughs> chess. Here's Gary Kasparov, who's the greatest chess player who ever lived. Here's Maria Konnikova, who's written a bunch of books about being a professional poker player. So in general, you meet lots of interesting people when you get in the top 1% of lots of different interests. Totally. And like I said, this book, Skip the Line, gives so many great gems for entrepreneurs of how they can, you know, skip this line and get to the top 1% of their field. And one of the first things that you talk about is you debunk the 10,000 hour rule. Now, all of us listening to this podcast, you've probably heard this rule a million times. It's from Ma Malcolm Gladwell. But for those of us who maybe don't know about it, what is the 10,000 hour rule? And why don't you like it? Sure. 10,000 hour rule is this idea, it, it originally comes from this guy, Anders Ericsson, who was a professor who did all the research for it. And basically he says, with 10,000 hours of what he calls deliberate practice, you could be the best, among the best in the world at anything. And he describes like how the Beatles had their 10,000 hours and he describes various experiments. You know, and Malcolm Gladwell wrote about this afterwards. And um, Anders Ericsson wrote a book called Peak that I highly recommend. But my view is, is that He's just, so deliberate practice means do something and then study it. Like what did you do wrong? And then repeat, do study, repeat, do study, repeat. And you just do that for 10,000 hours. So that's really good for repetitive tasks, like maybe a golf swing or memorizing lists of numbers or, you know, very repetitive to some extent, music, musical performance, not that you perform the same way every time, but if you're playing the piano, you play the same notes for the Moonlight Sonata every single time. You don't change. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the 10,000 hour rule. But I much prefer wh what I, I call it the 10,000 experiments rule, but it's really more like 100 or 200 experiments. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is, is that you should try to think of ways almost every day to experiment in your life. Uh, you know, I mentioned one, which was the, uh, you know, running for president. Mm -hmm. I, can anyone, well, the, the, the question was, can anyone run for president? The theory was yes. And the proof is, is that I was able to do it. So that's like a scientific experiment. You have, you're curious about something, you come up with a theory and then you test that theory. So another, uh, you know, all the time I'm doing experiments. When I was doing comedy, I would, I would experiment all the time on the stage, different things I can do to get people to laugh in, in business. You mm -hmm. want to be able to experiment. Well, you know, a lot of times you go into business, you think you're going to make money a certain way. But what if we, you know, charged as a service instead of as a product or as a product instead of a service? There's all sorts of things you can do to experiment in business to find the right combination of things that will make you a lot of money. So so I, I view as experiments as a, a really valuable, to, a quick and valuable way to learn incredible amounts of information relatively quickly. I'll give you another example of an experiment that I did. And it'll seem like a trivial example because that most experiments are just trivial. Like spending, you know, a half hour filing with the FEC.gov is sort of trivial. But, you know, you learn about democracy that way and you start to think, well, what's what's my platform? What are my issues? What do I believe in? <laughs> but, you know, another time, I remember looking on Twitter and this was when Trump was president 
and he tweeted, I want to buy Greenland, you know, the country Greenland. And I'm thinking, that's weird. Can you, can you just make an offer for a country on Twitter? <laughs> and then the prime minister of Denmark responded to him and said, it's not for sale. And I'm like, what does Denmark have to do with Greenland? Like Greenland's a thousand times bigger than Denmark. And did I just see a whole negotiation between world leaders about the fate of a country on Twitter? Like what is going on? And so I researched this, turned out Denmark did own Greenland. Turned out Greenland is, um, other than China, is the main source in the world for rare earth minerals. And in fact, China is the one drilling all over Greenland for rare earth minerals. So that's probably why President Trump wanted to, to buy it. And China pays Denmark a lot of money. It's probably why they didn't want to sell it. And so I started a, a Kickstarter to, to buy Greenland. I think <laughs> Kickstarter rejected me, but maybe Indiegogo, you know, one of these GoFundMe sites uh, uh, accepted it. And I wrote a whole thing. And it's like, you could, if you donate $100, you could be a Duke of Greenland. If you donate $1,000, I'll give you a thousand acres. If you donate ten thousand dollars, we'll make a national holiday named after you. And I wrote all the reasons why why I wanted to buy Greenland, so no other country can have it. Like it'll be Greenland for all. And so I wrote a whole article about you know, but as part of this crowdfunding campaign about Greenland, and it actually started raising thousands of dollars once I launched it. And then GoFundMe.com or which Indiegogo, one of those platforms, they shut me down. And they said, look, we realize you're doing a joke. We don't want to, and you're going to have to return all the money. We don't want to have all the credit card fees that we're going to, that we would eat. So you can't do it. But that was an experiment. I had never done a crowdfunding campaign before. I didn't know anything about Greenland. And it was really an experiment in writing. I was tired of writing in the normal format on a page that I usually write in. I, I wanted to write an article in the format of a Kickstarter campaign. So it was an experiment for me in writing, and I learned a, a, a whole bunch during the process and was raising money. It was going well. Who knows? Maybe I could have raised the, the goal. Yeah, it seems like it was it was on track for you to maybe, you know, be the king of, of <laughs> Green, what yeah, was it, Greenland? <laughs> yeah, of, the first of, citizen of Greenland. Of Greenland, yeah. That would be my title. Yeah. So let's, let's take a step back really quick. Like, what does skipping the line mean to you? And maybe you can walk us through an example in your life where you actually skipped the line in your career. Yeah, so skip the line means using alternative paths to achieving a goal. So alternative paths that nobody might realize mm. exist. So for instance, if you want to get if you really want your child to get into MIT, have them major in English, not a technology mm. area. Because nobody applies to MIT for drama or English, you know, so you're not competing with anybody you know, that's a, that's a kind of path you could take to skip the line. Uh, but, but, but even more to the point is there are shortcuts to learning. So if I want to learn another language, I don't just memorize the dictionary of Spanish in order to learn Spanish. I usually get a teacher and maybe get a software like a Duolingo. And then I get someone who's also learning Spanish and we could go back and forth and, and so on. So there's the one idea I have that I mentioned in, in the book called plus minus equal. Mm -hmm. So whenever you want to learn, learn something, the first thing you should do is get a plus, which is like a coach to teach you, get a minus someone you can teach because you don't truly understand something unless you can explain it simply to someone else and then get equals people who are moving up the path with you and you could exchange notes and camaraderie and, and, and so on. You could see you're not alone on this adventure of learning. And so that's a very valuable approach. So that, that approach actually was told to me by this guy, Frank Shamrock. Mm -hmm. Some listeners might know who he is. He was um, like an, the, the MMA champion through the late 90s and early 00s, world champion many times. And he had to often learn martial arts, a different martial art very quickly. And that's how he would do it, plus minus equal. And Can I just pause there? I love that. Like, I love that so much. And and when I heard you say that, I was listening to interviews that you were doing, and I heard you talk about this, I immediately thought like, wow, like, I definitely do this already. Like, I have a course that I teach, like, LinkedIn, it gets me better at LinkedIn. When I teach about podcasts, it makes me better at podcasts. It's so true. Like, you don't realize that you need to learn from someone, you need to learn from your peers. Like, you need to be coached by somebody, learn from your peers, and then also teach other people, it actually makes you better. 
Yeah. Young and Profiters, if you're anything like me, you take pride in your own personal space. And that's why I spent a lot of time on my apartment making the, the perfect pink palace for me, all set with the velvet couch, an in-home studio, and skyline views of the city. And while I love my apartment, I can get really sick of it. I can get really uninspired. And if you work from home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the good news is, like many of you guys, I'm an entrepreneur, and that means that I can work from anywhere. And so finally, this past holiday break, I decided to pack up my bags and my boyfriend, and we headed to Venice Beach, California. We got a bungalow with a fenced backyard, and the change of scenery and the fresh air really inspired some new ideas for my business. And now I'm hitting the ground running in Q1. Airbnb helped me make these California dreams come true. And in fact, Airbnb comes in clutch for me time and time again. Whether it's finding the perfect Airbnb home for our annual executive team outing or booking a vacation where my extended family can fit all in one place. Airbnb always makes it a great experience. And you know me, I'm always thinking of my latest business idea. And I found out that a lot of my successful friends and clients host on Airbnb. And I got curious. They told me it's a great additional passive revenue stream. And so I want to follow suit. Me and my boyfriend decided that we're going to spend more time in Miami. And then whenever we're back on the East Coast, we're going to Airbnb our place to make some extra money. So I can't wait for that. And a lot of people don't realize they've got an Airbnb right under their own noses. You can Airbnb your place or a spare room if you're out of town for even just a few days or weeks. You could do what I did and work remotely and then Airbnb your place to fund your trip. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. That's airbnb.com slash host to find out how much your home is worth. Very valuable. And because you you learn a lot, like you, you often when we're on the path to mastery, again, whether it's business or sports or whatever, when you're on the path to mastery, sometimes you forget the basics and having a minus always helps you to remember and deepen those, those basics. And I've heard this from everybody from the best in the world at what they do to the worst in the world. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very important concept and that's probably that. And, uh, you know, this idea of experiments, like always Mm -hmm. finding ways to experiment in whatever it is you're interested in. Again, some experiments might be trivial, but you still learn, but if you could experiment in the things you're interested in, you'll learn, you'll leapfrog everyone else who's just on the normal path to learning. Basically, it's a fight against the the regular path yep. because then the competition's too great. Like I mentioned cooking. Well, a billion people cook and a billion people read cookbooks and, you know, but are they getting better? Because there's too much competition on the normal path. You have to find, you have to find the shortcuts and I'm not saying cheating shortcuts. These are legit shortcuts, but you have to find ways to go off the path and experiments are a good way to do that plus minus equals are a good way to measure your progress because your plus your coach will tell you what you're doing wrong. will correct you and you continue forward. So I borrow that from the 10,000 hours, but I'm a firm believer. You don't need the 10,000 hours. Again, the goal is not to be the best in the world. That's very hard to do in any field. You're not going to be the best tennis player in the world by having a plus minus equal, but being the top 1%, that is very doable for most fields, for most people, Mm -hmm. whether it's business, investing, learning a language, uh, you know, learning tennis, learning chess, learning a musical instrument, learning stand-up comedy or public speaking or whatever. All of these things are within your grasp very quickly to be in the top 1%. Yeah. And I, I really like what you're saying because you're basically saying, get creative, find your own lane, find your own like nook within whatever niche that you're trying to do so that you can own it and be one of the best in that specific nook of your niche. Right. Um, so yeah. I do. And want- that's a good way to put it though, yeah. is, is niche. Like it, let's say you're interested in sports and mm-hmm. let's say you're interested in business. Mm-hmm. Well, the one way, one way to skip the line is to ask yourself, well, what's the intersection mm-hmm. of sports and business? I'm not, an, I'm not an athlete and maybe I don't even like business that much, but I might know a lot about business and I might know a lot about sports. So there's a guy, uh, Joe Pompliano, who has a newsletter called Huddle Up. During COVID, he started it when he was doing remote work. He was, he was a bond trader at, I think, Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan. And he started this newsletter about the, the business of sports. Like he just did an issue about how the Super Bowl makes money. And 
It was fascinating. And he's the, he's the only one in this intersection. So the newsletter has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He quit his job. He's making more money than he's ever made before. And it was by being, he wasn't the best in the world at sports. He wasn't the best in the world at business, but nobody else was in this intersection. So he quickly skipped the line and, and found a very big niche to be the best in the world mm -hmm. in. Yeah. I really like this. Like everything in this book, I just feel like my listeners are going to eat up. When I was when I was reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so interesting for entrepreneurs because we're always trying to find like, what is the next big idea to help us make money? Well, where can we dominate our influence and so on? But one of the things that I want to talk about is, is this paying dues mindset, right? Because even I get stuck on this. So for example, I've been podcasting for six years, right? I really blew up like a long time, a long time right? I, I got bigger, like two years into it. I was like one of the biggest podcasters on CastBox and LinkedIn. And then finally, I started doing well on Apple like four years ago. So when I see like, I'll see like some like newbie podcaster that like blew up on YouTube or something. And it's been like two months since they launched. You know, my first things is, well, is it real? You know, did they really do that? Or it's not going to be, you know, a long term thing, like it's going to be flash pan success. Those are the things that run in my mind when I see somebody who's like coming out of nowhere. And I know that's obviously an unhealthy way to think. But I feel like everybody has sort of this paying dues mindset, you better pay your dues, or it's not going to last, right? So talk to us about that. How can we stop having this type of a mindset, whether it's judging other people? Um, or you know, judging ourselves. Young and profiters, I've got a fun fact for you. Did you know that by 2030, over 85% of the jobs that will exist haven't even been invented yet? That's scary. And that's why we need to acquire new skills to stay relevant and adaptable. We've got to embrace lifelong learning so we can future-proof our careers and our businesses. And that's why you've got to check out Economist Education. Economist Education provides online executive education courses tailor-made for professionals just like us, crafted by the Economist's own editors and special experts. Economist Education courses are designed to sharpen your professional skills in key areas like data storytelling, critical thinking, sustainability, and so much more. I highly recommend checking out the Economist Education course, Business Writing and Storytelling. It's packed with so much valuable practical advice on how to inform and persuade through writing reports, social media presentations, and beyond. It's like a career blueprint, in my opinion. The best part, these courses are online, flexible, and self-paced, lasting anywhere from two to six weeks. You're guided by an expert tutor. You'll dive into a mix of videos, podcasts, texts, quizzes, and weekly assignments. Plus, you'll get a three-month digital subscription to The Economist to support your learning journey. Economist Education provides access to online forums where you can network with peers from around the globe. In a world where knowledge is power, Economist Education empowers you to lead the way. Economist Education is an incredible way to stay ahead in business. And I've got a special offer to get you started. Get 15% off any course only available by going to my special URL. That's education.economist.com slash profiting and then enter the promo code profiting at registration. This offer ends on March 31st, so don't wait. For 15% off, go to education.economist.com slash profiting and use code profiting at checkout. That's education.economist.com slash profiting. Yeah, I, I get a lot of that feeling as well. It's a similar type of feeling, you know, whether it's on books or podcasts, because I, I have a podcast as well. And, you know, it's it's hard because just issuing the, uh, addressing the, the paying dues issue no, that's just a myth. You don't have, there's no dues to pay. No one is standing in line saying, <laughs> okay, you can't be a success until you pay me a hundred dollars or a hundred dollars a week or whatever. Like, you know, part of success also, there's a little bit of a luck factor. Nobody is successful at all without luck. Like I worked at a company that didn't have a, a big major fortune 500 company that didn't have a website in the nineties. That was lucky for me. I was able to tell them, I'll do your website. And I was friends with people who were designers and I was a programmer. So I was lucky there. And, and I was in New York city. There's a luck factor of where you are because New York city at that time had more opportunities than any other city for, for that kind of business. And so there's a lot of luck that comes into success. All you can do is master yourself in terms of how you approach, you know, getting better at something, improving at something, making connections. And 
you know, it's, you know, the I, everybody always told me you can't do something. You People still would say, like in stand-up comedy, oh, you know, you have to do six years like this, then five years like this, then three years like this. That's how you pay your dues. I'm, I'm, I was, an, you know, in my 40s at the time I started doing stand-up comedy. I'm not going to spend 15 years doing what they told me to do. Who are they to tell me? And again, that's why you start looking for, well, what are, they, what are the easier ways to learn or what are the faster ways to learn? What are the faster ways to, to skip the line using the resources I have? Or Everybody's got some resources. What are the faster ways? Well, I had a podcast so I could bring on super comedians onto my podcast to learn from them. How did they do it? And so I could, nobody has that opportunity when you're 20 years old. Now, people who are 20 have other opportunities. I had my opportunity. So I was able to get advice from all these amazing people on how to do comedy or, uh, uh, you know, so I didn't have to pay the normal dues again, through experiments, through using your resources, through finding plus minus equals through, um, you know, another practice that I do that's very valuable is, and I still do it to this day is I write 10 ideas a day. Mm. And so the idea there is, is that we all are creative. Nobody is not creative. We're born to be creative. And, but because society is so easy and so comfortable, we often don't have opportunity to use our creativity. And creativity is a muscle. If you, what happens if you don't walk for two weeks? You need physical therapy to walk again. Your muscles atrophy really quickly. Same with the creativity muscle. So every day I take a waiter's pad because it's nice, it fits in my pocket. It's nice to write easy bullet points. I take a waiter's pad and I write 10 bad ideas because you can't, you can't write 3,650 good ideas a year. So 10 bad ideas a day. Most of them are bad. Maybe every now and then there's a decent idea, but I do it not to come. I never look at the ideas again. So I'm not doing it to come up with a good idea. I'm doing it just to exercise that creativity muscle mm. and it grows. It, it becomes a powerful muscle. If you weight lift, you grow your muscles. If you do this, you grow your creativity muscle. And then when I really need my creativity, like when I'm really looking for a good idea, it's much more, it's much easier for me to do it because I've spent time doing this. But that means instead of paying my dues on an interest that I have, I'm able to come up with creative ways to go around the, the gatekeepers, the people who are collecting the dues. So when I was interested in investing, you know, normally to start a hedge fund, which is like a way to invest wealthy people's money. In order to start a hedge fund, you usually have to go to Harvard, then work at Goldman Sachs, then work at a big hedge fund. And now you've paid your dues. Now you have the pedigree to start a hedge fund. I didn't have any of that. I was a computer programmer who had just lost all of my money. And so here I was studying, investing. I wrote software to help me invest. I really was trying to, to master this, this thing called investing. And I just started cold writing other famous investors and giving them ideas based on my 10 ideas a day. Mm. And some of them responded and eventually became investors in my brand new fund. They liked some of my ideas. And that's how I started. I started a whole career that way uh, because I write ideas often for other people. Like I might write 10 ideas for Google and then I'll send it to someone at Google, 10 ideas for LinkedIn. <laughs> and I'll send it to somebody at LinkedIn. So I've, I've now been either a consultant or I've spoken at, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Quora, Airbnb, and tons of other places just from this, this process. Nobody knew who I was. I wasn't like a famous person or anything, but I would try to send my very best ideas to them. And it was because of exercising this creativity muscle. If there's anything in that, in that book that's important, that's the most important thing is writing 10 ideas a day. So let's let's dig into this. Uh, coming up with good ideas or bad ideas, I guess, just like this idea creativity. Uh, we talked about intersections a bit, but we didn't talk about something related, which you call purpose sex. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and, and I, I also call it idea sex. I call it a couple of things. And the idea is, it's sort of like that sports and business example is that you want to come up with two con two things that you're either interested in or know about and explore what the intersection of those things are. So, you know, um, for instance, App Apple does this quite a bit. So they were a computer company for 30 years. 
And then suddenly they wanted to combine, uh, let's combine the radio with computers. And the idea sex that resulted was the iPod, the first iPod. Oh, let's combine the iPod with phones. And the result was the smartphone, the iPhone. Mm. Oh, let's combine computers with this flat surface we've been doing with our phones. Oh, so now they have the iPad. So idea sex could create completely new industries. Uh, you know, let's say you're making a restaurant. Okay, there's a million Mex Mexican restaurants on this street. But there's people who might, in the next town over, there's a lot of sushi restaurants. So let's make uh, the sushi rito restaurant. We're going to make <laughs> burritos of raw fish or whatever. This might be a bad idea, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you always can combine two concepts to find something creative. Let's say you love guitars and you love history. Well, how about looking at the history of the world in terms of the evolution of guitars? Because obviously they went from very primitive guitars to all the way up to electric guitars. And in a, in a weird way, that describes the history of technology, the history of music, the history of civilization as we know it. So idea sex is a very powerful tool in, when coming up with ideas. Yeah. And, and something else that you have a whole chapter about is called idea calculus. And apparently you can, you know, subtract, divide, multiply ideas. So I'd love to get an overview of that. Yeah. So for instance, let's say, you know, let's say you're, you're, well, let's say you have a podcast mm -hmm. and now you want to, let's, what are ways to multiply this podcast? Well, by multiplying, it means kind of taking the podcast and scaling it in ways that you wouldn't be able to do individually. Mm -hmm. So you could start a podcast network, for instance, and you bring on other podcasts and your job is now to place the ads mm -hmm. and you get a cut of all those ads. So now you not only have the business of your podcast, but you have this network where you already were placing ads on your podcast, mm -hmm. but now you get to spread around to more podcasts and place those ads. You've now multiplied your podcast. Or here's another way. You do your podcast and you release it on all the platforms like Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Sirius, and, and on and on. But what about putting your podcast on TikTok or YouTube? Or guess what? If you upload your podcast to Amazon Prime, your video version of your podcast to Amazon Prime, it would actually become an Apple Prime TV show. And it'll be right next to all the other Apple Prime TV shows when you search for your podcast. Most people don't realize that. So there's all sorts of things you can do. A, with experimenting, and B, with this idea of manipulating, you know, the math of ideas. Mm. So uh, idea subtraction, I'm forgetting some of the examples I had in, in the book there, but, you know, basically, what if you had your podcast and, oh, for TikTok, they only allow 60 seconds. Mm. So let's take the concept of a podcast, figure out how to do uh, an episode with what's the most important thing in this episode with James okay, we're going to make a TikTok 60-second podcast uh, mm -hmm. with James. So that's like idea subtraction. So if you take one concept of podcast and apply all these different ideas to it, then you'll suddenly be everywhere. And, uh, and, and you'll have lots of different formats. One of them might hit and be super popular. But you know, in order to have luck, and earlier I said success requires luck, in order to have luck, you need to basically expand the, the, the area of luck in your life. Mm -hmm. So yes, your podcast on Spotify could get lucky and go viral. But imagine if you also had a 60 second podcast on TikTok and uh, a show on Amazon Prime that you uploaded yourself and a, a podcast network where you're just trying to make money, but one of the other podcasts becomes huge and viral and suddenly you're making like great money now with, with the podcast concept by having a podcast network. The, you've expanded basically the surface area of your luck mm. and that often results in, in great success. Mm. So good. And so let's say we come up with, you know, an idea that we think is great. How do we stress test it to make sure that there's actually people who would want this idea from us? Very important question because people often say ideas are a dime a dozen, execution is everything. And this is just totally not true because in order... Execution, execution doesn't mean one thing. You have to have execution ideas on how to execute. 
there are good execution ideas and bad execution ideas. So let's say we, you and I came up with a business idea and we said, oh, this is so good. We're going to make, you know, an AI that figures out what everybody should order in a restaurant. I don't know, whatever <laughs> it is. We're going to raise $2 million. We're going to hire a bunch of programmers. We're going to program this up over the next year. And then we're going to start selling it to restaurants, our new software package to restaurants. Well, that's a horrible execution idea. How about instead you go, a friend of yours has a restaurant. We go to that friend and say, listen, can we go from table to table this night and see if we can help everybody with their orders? And we'll see, oh, everybody already had their preferences even before they got to the restaurant. They knew what they wanted to order. So this is a bad idea. So we shouldn't waste a year of our lives mm -hmm. and $2 million of, of people's money and trying to raise the money um, to do this idea. It's a bad idea. So often when you try to break things down and do things manually as quick as, as maybe it might not be the exact product, but you could usually test, do people even want this? Do people even, even remotely want this? You know, people already, the hard thing about business is people already know, they've already filled up their 24 hours a day. You and I and everybody listening, we already have things to do all 24 hours of the day. When you start a new business, that means you're saying some people are going to do something new in, in part of those 24 hours. And that new includes a product that I create or service I invent or whatever. And most people don't want anything new. They're fine with their 24 hours a day. I'm fine mostly with my 24 hours a day. Do I really want the Apple Vision Pro to change my 24 hours? Maybe. Uh, it's got to be great though. And so most ideas are pretty bad. That's why most ideas are pretty bad and won't work. So it's good to execute as cheaply and quickly as possible. And that's an important part of skipping the line. It's a really great piece of advice because I've seen way too many entrepreneurs invest money in a website and to your point, getting investors or whatever for an idea that seems, you know, like so unrealistic that anybody would gravitate. I remember I was doing an audio event and a girl told me that she is into astrology. She's creating an app so people can create a theme song based on their horoscope. And I was like, has anybody, I, I was just blunt with her. I was like, has anybody ever asked you for anything like that? Have you like, I know you're working on this app now, but have you researched to see if anybody's interested in having a theme song based on their horoscope? Just because it just didn't seem like a problem that people actually have. Exactly. Like she could have easily gone to a friend of hers or 20 friends and say, listen, tell me your horoscope. Okay. Give me a week. I'm going to come up with theme song based on what I know about you and your horoscope. She could have done it. And then she could have said to each one of those friends, okay, I will let you own this song for $5. And she could have just seen who, who was eager to pay. If only a few out of 20 were eager to pay, it's probably not a good business idea. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want, nobody I know would want that. So, um, but yeah, people often forget that execution, there's not one path to execution, there's infinite paths. And, you know, if I had said, I'm not going to start a hedge fund until I work at Goldman Sachs first, and then I work at a big hedge fund, I wouldn't have started. Instead, I just wrote to the biggest investors I knew, said, here's my software, here are my ideas. What do you think? And then some of them gave me money. So, yeah, it's always great to always listen to what your audience is telling you. And luckily, you know, uh, that girl is on track now. So that's good. Um, OK, let's talk about skills, because I know it's really important. You talk about getting one percent better and you also talk about micro skills. So can you give us an overview of what we need to think about or do differently when it comes to skills and trying to gain that one percent of mastery in our industry? Yeah, like, let's say, you know, how, let's say you get out of school or whatever, or you say right now, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start a business. Well, there's no such skill as business. That's like a name of a, a bunch of skills put together. So in order to be good at business, you have to be good at sales, leadership, marketing, coming up with ideas, executing well, uh, negotiating, persuasion. There's, there's, there's enormous skills that have nothing like, Sales has nothing to do with leadership. Marketing has nothing to do with execution. Like maybe you have to either be a programmer or know how to manage programmers. So managing people has nothing to do with selling people so, or, 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 or dealing with money. So all of these skills are, are different 
skills that you have to learn. And again, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be really good. You have to be in the top 1% of the intersection of all these skills. And by the way, some skills, you just need to be really good at delegating. So that's another skill you have, you have to learn. Mm. Like maybe you can't be a computer programmer. So you have to be very, very good at delegating that skill and then managing the programmer because that's a difficult skill. And, uh, you know, for, for, for tennis, if you want to be good at tennis, there's multiple skills. You have to be good at a serve. You have to be good at forehand, backhand. You have to be good at psychology because you have to keep motivating yourself when you're losing. You have to be good at, uh, you have to be fast. You have to be a good runner. Uh, you know, starting around the eighties, tennis players started weightlifting more to, they realized that was an important skill they needed. Uh, you know, it's, it's in any, in every field that's worth doing. There's, there are a lot of skills in cooking, you know, baking is different than, you know, making a hot meal. So, you know, like a steak, uh, so there's lots of skills in every field and you have to kind of, what, what is the field you're interested in? What are the micro skills? Where would you rank yourself on all those micro skills? And am I doing the right plus minus equal for each one of those micro skills? All of that is, is super important. Now, do you feel that we should be focusing on our strengths or focusing on improving our weaknesses when it comes to our skills? There's, there's different schools of thought on this. And I'm always interested in this question too. On the one hand, if you focus on your weaknesses, you you it, it, there's potential for faster improvement. So if you're ranking everything on a scale of one to ten, you, once you're at a ten, it's harder to improve. But if you're at a one in something, it's e it's easier for me to improve my Spanish in one day, mm. percentage wise, than it is to improve my English. I already know English. I don't know Spanish at all. So I could double my knowledge of Spanish in a day and double it again the next day, and and so on. Whereas I can't do that in English. But the flip side of that is, you know, work with what you have. So, you know, if, if you're good at situations, if you're good at selling, let's say you're a natural salesperson, you already, and, and on top of being an, a natural talent, you have skills in sales, and then you're starting a new business. Well, don't be the computer programmer, be the salesperson. Mm -hmm. So you should focus in terms of executing, you should focus on what you're good at. And that's very important. If you're not good at raising money, don't raise money again, try other ways to test your idea rather than raise money. If you're great at raising money and if you can just snap your fingers and raise money, then by all means do that because in some ways it's easier to start a business if you're not worried about money. So uh, I would say overall, it's good to focus on your, on your strengths. And by the way, that's not just me saying that. Politicians, they, if you notice, it's, let's say, let's say, Donald Trump is weak with getting the African American vote. I don't know if he is or not. I'm not saying anything political, but and he's strong with getting the white male vote and not even the white female vote. He should probably focus his campaign efforts on white males because that's mm. who's going to be motivated to come out and vote for him. And let's say Joe Biden is good at getting the black female vote. They they all want to vote for him. I'm just saying that's what he should focus on. And that's what they do. That, I'm not saying, this is not my recommendation. This is what they do. This is what politicians do, is they, they, they primarily focus on their strengths. You never see a candidate campaigning where everybody hates him. Mm. So smart. And one other thing about skills that I thought was interesting that I talk about a lot is actually borrowing skills from one experience and bringing it to the next experience. So can you talk to us about the importance of uh, being able to transfer your skills like that? Yeah, that's a really f fantastic concept. I forgot about that from, from the book. But for instance, I was always an extremely nervous public speaker. Like I was always invited to speak at conferences, speak at companies, speak at c college classrooms and so on, whether it's about entrepreneurship or writing or whatever, and or even podcasting. And I thought I was okay at public speaking and people seemed to enjoy my talks and I gave some TED talks and so on but I wasn't comfortable with it. And I didn't really feel like I was that good. And then I started doing stand-up comedy. And within just like a month, I had 10 X my ability to public speak. Cause when you're doing public speaking, most of the time, the typical public speaker doesn't move around the stage, mm. doesn't make funny voices, doesn't do crowd work, doesn't uh, handle the mic very well, doesn't handle the stage very well. It doesn't know how to what's called tribe build where you make one part of the audience that doesn't like you 
join the tribe of the audience that likes you. These are all skills in stand-up comedy, but they're not skills in public speaking. But when I went back into public speaking after doing some stand-up comedy, I couldn't believe mm. how much my public speaking had improved because I borrowed these skills from comedy. So I might've been only top 10% in comedy at some of these skills, but in public speaking, I was top one-tenth of 1% because public speakers aren't known as comedians. And that, that was very valuable for me. I thought public speaking, I could borrow those skills into comedy, but it didn't really work in that direction. Sometimes you don't always know the direction. Mm. Computer programming has a lot of skills that I, I became a computer programmer after I was a chess player. If this happens, then what happens next? Then what happens next? It's an important skill. You have to picture it in your head for computer programming, but it's a skill you, you is the only skill in chess. And uh, there's, there's lots of things like that. So think about all the things, let's say you're interested in cooking, but you're, I don't know, you're a tennis player. Uh, I can't even think of it offhand. What skills from tennis can you bring into uh, learning how to cook? Well, for one thing, discipline, working hard, waking up early and practicing, you know, getting better at times that you don't think of as cooking times. Mm. These are all things you, pro the discipline that you learned when learning how to be a great tennis player could probably translate to being a great chef. Mm. Yeah, I always talk about this on the podcast, basically skill stacking. And it reminds me of failures too, because uh, every experience that you have, a job that you maybe don't like anymore, or maybe you got fired from it, you still take those skills and you get to bring it to your next job. And you don't, to your point, you don't really know what you're going to end up using. But in every experience that I've ever had in my life, I always are, and like in a new experience being like, wow, like because I have this skill from this other thing that I did, even though it was a failure, now I'm better than everybody in this particular thing that I'm doing because I've got this new perspective. Yeah, like let's say, so you you have a podcast. Let's say now you wanted to write a book. Well, one thing, one skill you've learned from podcasting is the ability to storytell and, and to keep people's attention. So you could bring that storytelling skill and, and you have limited time to keep people's attention. Some writers think they have infinite time to keep people's attention because they're stuck reading the book, but that's not true. Mm. So you know how important it is to tell, to get to the important point of a story really fast and, and do it quickly and then move on. And you would borrow that skill from podcasting and bring it into writing as, as another example. So, and then there's these meta skills like, how, how did you get good at podcasting to begin with? Well, you watched other podcasts. So if you want to get good at writing, you read other books that, and try to mimic the style of, of those you know until you're good enough. You don't need to mimic that style. So there's meta skills and there's skills, but you could borrow all of that from going from podcasting to some other form of self-expression. Yeah. So, so many great things that we talked about today. One last piece that I want to cover from your book is this idea called frame control. And I thought this was really relevant for business. I thought this was relevant for people's personal lives. Uh, so I'd love for you to explain what frame control is and why you think it's so like an important skill to have. Yeah. Frame control. So this is an important concept in almost every area of life, whether it's relationships or sales or or stand-up comedy or public speaking or, or, you know, anything that involves interaction with other people, dealing with your children, dealing with your parents uh, or colleagues at work. So the, con the basic concept is in any interaction between two people, one person has the frame. Even in a podcast, we're kind of going back and forth, but mostly I have the frame because I'm the guest and um, I could, I could, you could direct where you wanted to go, but I could switch it around a little bit more. I'm a little bit more in control as the guest because you're a gracious host. And, but in a, in comedy, for instance, what if the audience stops laughing and now you get nervous and you stop being funny because the audience is silent. You've just given them the frame. Very important in stand-up comedy to always control the frame. And in a relationship, this happens all the time. Uh, you ever notice in an argument, whether it's with, someone you're partnered with or or a friend or someone you're arguing with that if they're not right on a certain way they quickly change the subject in subtle ways mm. like oh you do this you do this no i don't oh but you do this 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 you have to point out you can do you can you can take the frame back by using a technique called labeling did you just you ask did you just change the subject i'm happy to talk about that other subject later but can we stick to the subject we started with so that's labeling 
what it is you're having the discussion about so they can't go out they can't control the frame and bring it to some other issue that you don't want to talk about mm. uh and again that's good for sales obviously good in relationships good for for anything um you know, so that's that's one example. I give many examples and techniques. Can we talk about book. your asking for a raise example? I think that's relevant for anyone in corporate. Yeah, I love this one because this is, and this is this is money in the bank. This has made me tons of money. This <laughs> one technique, and I call this the advice technique in keeping the frame. So typically, you go into your boss and you say, "Look, I've worked here ten years. So and so just got a raise. I'd like a raise," and your boss says, well, what do you, what, what, what salary do you want? How much money do you want to make? And you can tell already they're a little skeptical and they're not being very friendly about it. So you change the frame. You, you, instead of being like, this is an employee boss situation, you, you change this to an advice situation. You change the frame. So you say, listen, I'm every day, I'm neck deep in the job I'm doing. I'm a, lawyer or computer programmer. I'm just doing computer programming all day long. But you, um, you know, you're someone I've worked with for several years. I've seen you in action. Um, you've dealt with a lot of these situations where you help employees along and you, and you, you offer jobs and you figure out how much they should make. So let's, let's say you were me, what advice would you give me? Someone in my situation who, uh, would like a raise, like, what would you tell me? You know, what, what would you advise me to ask for? And, he, and you, now you've given your boss status, mm. like maybe before he thought you hated him because he's your boss, but now you've given him status. You, he's someone you admire. He, as someone with status, he doesn't want to give you, he doesn't want to ruin your opinion of him. He doesn't want to give you bad advice. This, and it sounds ridiculous. Like he's almost going to, it sounds like he's going to think you're using a technique, but he's not, or she's not like, they're going to give you good advice at that point. And I've gotten much more out of negotiations than I could have ever hoped for by doing this advice. Like even when I'm selling a company, they say, well, how much do you want? And I say, listen, I've been, I've been neck deep building this company every day, 24 hours a day for the past three years. Uh, you, you're the one who buys companies. I'd love to work with you. You, you, you know, that's the reason why we're having this conversation in the first place. I really admire what your company is doing. And I hope even if you don't acquire us, you could, we could partner. I want to work with you what would you advise me to ask, mm. to ask for? They're going to give you good advice. They're, they're going to say, well, you know, you're a good company and you could probably go for X million dollars. Oh, I'm thinking in my head, that's 10 times what I was going to ask. Deal. Yeah. And they're more likely to probably stick to what they said because they don't want to go back on their word after they gave you that great advice. Right. Like something that always happens whenever you sell a company is that somebody gets remorse, like the buyer gets buyer's mm -hmm. remorse and doesn't want to buy you anymore or wants to renegotiate. They're less likely to get buyer's remorse if they're the ones who told you to ask for this price. Yeah, it's such a great strategy. Well, James, this was such an awesome conversation. Um, I thought maybe we could close this out with you just giving a piece of advice for everybody who is looking to skip the line. What's your advice, your last piece of advice for skipping the line? Yeah, and this one is not as as easy in some sense as some of the other techniques, but it's not a technique really. It's don't be goal oriented. Be be the become the better person that becomes the type of person who can achieve those goals. Mm. So don't think I absolutely need to get into Harvard. I absolutely need to make a hundred million dollars. Instead, work on yourself, you know, physically, try to exercise, try to sleep well, try to eat well emotionally, you're not going to come up with a great business idea. If you're arguing with your spouse and kids every day, creatively write 10 ideas a day, spiritually give up on what you can't control and don't be anxious about the future, which you can't control and don't have regrets about the past that's done. So those things, if you improve 1% a day at those four things, physical, emotional, creative, spiritual, you're going to, and then of course, 1% a day at improving your skills in whatever area you love. You're going to get, you're going to go on an, a very interesting journey and have many adventures along the way. And you're going to get some goals, even ones you didn't expect. And they'll be much better than the goals you were initially hoping for, I, I'm sure. Mm. So that's, that's the, the way to think about it. That's also a good way to avoid imposter syndrome and, 
and all sorts of other bad or or this feeling that you have to pay the dues. Mm -hmm. You are paying the dues because you're working on yourself. Totally. Okay, so I end my show with two questions that I ask all of my guests, and this can have nothing to do with the topic that we talked about today, sure. whatever it comes to mind. So uh, one of the last questions that I ask my guests is, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? And this can have uh, nothing to do with the conversation that we had today. Yeah, ask for a 10% discount next time you go to coffee. Why is that? Let's say you go to a Starbucks. In fact, Hala, you should do this right after this podcast. Okay. Go to a Starbucks. They're going to give you, or any coffee place, they're going to give you your cup of coffee, maybe a pastry, whatever you like to order. And just, you're going to be nervous the first time. Just say with a straight face, can I have a 10% discount, please? <laughs> and they'll say, particularly if it's Starbucks, which is like a chain, so they don't have as much control. They're going to say, uh, why would you like a 10% discount? And you say, no reason. I just would really like a 10% discount today. And they're going to probably, they're, they're going to, they're going to say, let me talk to my manager. He's going to come up to you. What do you want? Oh, I'd like a 10% discount. Why? I just want a 10% discount. Don't give a reason. And they're going to say no, probably. Sometimes they say yes. They're going to say no. And this is how you practice the, A, the rejection muscle. You're going to mm -hmm. get rejected a lot. B, this is how you ask, you practice asking for what you want, <laughs> because why shouldn't you? They, they've charged $7 for a cup of coffee. Like, why shouldn't you get what you want here? And these are two important muscles that most people don't exercise. Asking for things, asking for help. Most people don't ask for help when they need yeah. it. Asking for a 10% discount is going to feel really awkward. Yeah. So you're practicing being in awkward situations, which is going to happen to entrepreneurs all the time. I remember one time I was selling a website I, so Tupac, the rapper, he had just died. His mom, this is in the nineties. His mom wanted to make a website for his posthumous album. I went in there to pitch the website and the guy, the manager asked me to demo my stuff. He had like an IBM PC and I only knew Macintosh. So I couldn't turn, even turn on the computer. Mm. I didn't know how. And so I'm a, supposed to be a computer guy <laughs> with made hundreds of websites and they literally laughed me. I, I'm at the elevator. They're still laughing. They laughed me out of the oh office. Oh, my God. And, and then another the second half hour later, I'm back in my office. All my employees say, did you get the gig? And I said, maybe, because <laughs> I was awkward there, too. Like, it's very, you get into awkward situations all the time. So the 10% challenge is a way to practice getting over that awkwardness asking for difficult things and handling rejection better. So good. Okay, last question. And this is something that I ask all my guests. We do something fun at the end of the year with it. What is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond just business. The secret to, obviously the secret to, I shouldn't say obviously, the secret to profiting in life is to be happy with what you have right now, to have no, as few expectations as possible. Reality or happiness equals reality divided by expectations. So the fewer your expectations, your your reality is, or your happiness goes much higher. So, like if you if you want to lose a hundred pounds, uh, and you're already and let's say you're two hundred pounds, it's gonna be very hard to lose a hundred pounds. But if you only want to lose one pound, that's that's and that will make you happy. You're gonna much more likely to be happy. Mm. So happiness is reality divided by expectations. Try to expect as little as possible from the people around you and the situations around you. Doesn't mean you could have you can't have goals and achieve them. It just means don't expect a lot on a daily basis. Well, you've given us so much great advice today. Where can everybody learn more from you and everything that you do? I think they can learn the most by re-listening to this episode on, on your <laughs> podcast. That's you got a lot out of me. So I kind of have to read my book over. To, <laughs> To, I have to re I, I usually have to read my books over to remember. You can't always remember what you write. But um, yeah. You did an amazing just, job, James. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks, Hala. Where, uh, do, do you want to let everybody, I'll do that again if you want to say like your, your website or no, whatever. No, no, if they'll Google me and then figure it out. Awesome. Thanks so much, James. Thank you.